You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking today with another one of the five widows of Ecuador. We have sort of lived with that name for many years. And my guest is Barbara Udarian. And I think of a story that she told me about when she was invited to speak in a church, and the pastor sort of raced in breathless at the last minute, and as they were going up the aisle, asked her to repeat her name, and she said, I'm Barbara Udarian. Well, he was quite flustered, and when he got up to introduce her, he said he was very happy that we have with us this evening Mrs. Barbarian. <laughs> now, I, I want to tell you, Barb, that since you've known me more than 25 years, you're allowed to call me Betty on this program. My Thank listeners you, <laughs> know me as Elizabeth, but um, anybody who has known me more than 25 years can call me Betty, so feel free. Don't worry about that. I want to ask you, Barb, what led to your being asked to speak? I had been a missionary with the Gospel Missionary Union, and being a uh, one of the widows of the five men, uh, the church was interested in in the story, and I I went there to speak. And you were had been at that time in Ecuador for how many years? Can you remember? We had been there about three and a half years, serving with the Hebrew Indians at that at that time. Barb, would you tell us a little bit of your own background? What made you want to be a missionary, or was it just Raj's idea? Oh, no. When I was but a child, I accepted the Lord when I was five years old. And I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was shortly after that that I began began to uh, think about being a missionary. I really didn't want to be. I was always the quiet, afraidy cat, middle, middle kid in our family. And I couldn't believe God would speak into my heart. I remember how I used to put uh, a pillow over my head, and it seemed like I could shut out the voice of God uh, during my growing up years. And um, I didn't realize at the time how important it is to listen to God and not to shut Him out. But finally, God, in His goodness, uh, sent me to Kentucky to work for a summer. And it was down there that working with the little um, children under the Scripture Memory Mission that I realized that God did really want me to serve, and, and I loved working with the children, and, and that's where I gave my, my um, heart full-time to God. I didn't care where, I didn't care when, I didn't care how God sent me. I just wanted to go. And how old would you have been then? I was about 20 at that uh -huh. time. Mm -hmm. Had you met Roger Udarian? I had not. So tell mm -hmm. us that story. Well, from... Um, Kentucky then. I went back home to Michigan and then on to Northwestern at, uh, in Minneapolis. Went to school there and it was while I was at Northwestern that I met Roger. He had just come home from the war and um, was attending school there too. Am I right that he was a paratrooper in World War II? Yes, he was. And you met him at Northwestern. At Northwestern. It was while he was in England, just before he made the jump uh, over uh, the Rhine, that um, he came to know the Lord as his Savior. And at that time, um, everything was different. He just, it, his whole complete life was changed, and all he wanted to do was serve God. What attracted you to him on that campus? Oh, there was lots of things. He was tall. He was good-looking. Uh, the first time I saw him, uh, he was in, still in his paratroop uniform because he, had just, he was just on his way home. And uh, I thought that he was about the most handsome man I'd ever seen in my life. And then he came back to school. We were in the same prayer band. I was attracted, I, I believe, by his dedication, his um, perseverance in, in searching out, in uh, looking to God, in trusting Him, in um, being what I thought a man of God should be. In other words, you were convinced that he was deadly serious Yes, about doing the will of God. Yes. Now, we'll skip over and find yourselves in the jungle of Ecuador, working with what tribe? With the Hebrew Indians, the former headhunters, who are now known as the Shwar Indian. Uh, and we worked there for three and a half years with them. They weren't just head hunters; they were also head shrinkers, they weren't were they? They were head shrinkers, yes. Famous for some secret formula whereby they could shrink human heads to the size of an orange with the hair still attached and the features still discernible, recognizable. That's right, uh -huh. yes. Mm -hmm. 
Did you have any misgivings about going into that kind of a situation in the jungle? No, I did not. Um, I knew there were other missionaries in there. There had been no killings amongst the missionaries by the Indians. Um, we just heard good reports, although there were a lot of hard things to go in. And yet, um, we look forward to that. We look forward to serving God uh, amongst this this group of Indians. I barely met Raj. I guess I saw the two of you on a few occasions, but not in any way that it would sit, sit down and talk with him. But I can just remember that my impression was that this man was absolutely serious and sold out to God. I don't mean humorless, but that his purpose was firm. And I can remember Nate Saint. Uh, he was the MAF pilot in Ecuador who served all of our stations. And I can remember Nate talking about Raj and the way Raj opened up a new area of the Shuar Indians. Is that, isn't that correct? Or was it Shuar? Or am I, I'm mixing up Hiveros and Shuars. No, that's right. The Shuar is the, their own name for the people. And, and as uh, Hivero meant um, barbarian and uneducated, they, when they realized what the term was, they uh, insisted upon their own name, but he did um, go down to the Ashwar, which was a cousins of the Shwar, and um, was able to open up a station down there. And uh, as a result, the chief and nearly his whole tribe came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. He was the first missionary into that area, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, I should say that he and Frank Drown went together. Mm -hmm. Frank had tried to go before, but he was uh, sent back. Roger was the first one to meet the uh, Atchwater chief. Roger was called out to work on a hospital. He stayed with Nate and Marge Saint. Uh -huh. And it was while he was there that he became acquainted with Jim and Ed and, and Pete. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just the last minute that he was um, asked to join the group, although he was in the planning sessions for all those weeks. I remember that Nate came out to talk to us about this guy, Rod Udarian, whom none of us knew very well, but he had nothing but the highest praise. And he said, I think he's the man that we need to complete the team for Operation Alka. And so Nate flew each of these men, Raj and Ed and Pete and Jim, uh, one at a time, into the Kodadai River to a little sand strip. And this story is told in my book called Through Gates of Splendor. Operation Alka ended in what the world would call a disaster. All five of the men speared to death. How do you feel about using that term disaster, Barbara? I believe it was Ed's father, Mr. McCauley, that, that said, um, had a little tract on... Uh, from tragedy to triumph. And I think that best describes the whole Operation Alka outcome, that God used it. It was for the glory of God that um, it came out as it did. Many souls have been saved. The Alkas um, ha have come to know uh, God, and many other people have been challenged to go to the field through it. So I would say it's a triumph. Can you think of any of those people? Can, do you know some stories of people who have gone out? Any one specific person that comes to mind? Or people that have told you when you've gone out to speak of how your husband's Well, I, I believe the most interesting one to me, I, there's just been a myriad of people. I, but I was in Texas and found, uh, met a cowboy chaplain. And I was very um, interesting uh, uh, when he, he said that it was through the um, seeing the film that he eventually became saved and eventually served the Lord. And today he's a, a cowboy chaplain and uh, has brought many of the uh, cowboys to the Lord through through being their chaplain. Isn't that something? I, I've never heard of a cowboy chaplain before, but it's wonderful. And everywhere I go, people tell me just really thrilling stories. So often they will preface it by saying, oh, I know you hear this everywhere you go, and you're tired of hearing all these stories. Who could get tired of hearing the ways in which God has turned a tragedy into triumph. My guest today was Barbara Udarian, widow of Roger Udarian of Ecuador, South America. <laughs> <laughs> 